Uh, Kurt Beckmeyer uh, is our next speaker. He's the Senior Vice President of uh, Applied Research and Associates. Uh, he serves the, on the Board of Directors and leads their transportation practice. Uh, Mr. Beckmeyer is a registered professional engineer in several states and has more than 25 years of civil engineering experience. Uh, experience in pavement engineering, asset management, performance measures, and technology deployment. During his career, Mr. Beckmeyer has helped numerous organizations manage their roadway infrastructure and today is going to share some of the company's innovations in the era of area of roadway evaluation and pavement management as they relate to pavement preservation. So welcome, Kurt. Thank you, Darren. Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this group. So today I'm going to, to highlight an innovative technology that an agency can use to quantify and assess pavement conditions and help support an effective pavement preservation program. And hopefully I'll you know, be able to address maybe some of the gaps that, that Jeff Hall identified in his earlier presentation and maybe move us all towards uh, a little closer towards the goal of, of pavement preservation. So measuring pavement structural response under a moving wheel load traveling at normal highway speeds is a monumental technical challenge and it's been pursued by many for, for many years and only in recent years has there been some, some achievement of that goal? So one of these devices, as Darren mentioned, is a rolling wheel deflectometer, and I'm gonna to highlight that today. Um, and really my goal is to, to not go into the complexities and the details of the RWD system, uh, but really to, to maybe help demonstrate the ease and simplicity of which that data can be used to, to support a, a pavement preservation program. So in my presentation, I'll, I'll go through a little bit of background on the RWD. I'm not sure how, what the familiarity with, with it is amongst this group. Then I'm gonna dive into a, 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 an FHWA sponsored study that we conducted in collaboration with the Oklahoma DOT. And I'll, I'll go through some of the, the objectives, the purpose, and, and the outcomes. And you know, it was, a, it was a fairly extensive study. What I'm gonna present today is a, a pretty small subset of what was done there. Um, and then time permitting, I want to share with you some new developments that, that have been with the technology. Again, moving closer and closer to the goal of supporting uh, a robust system for assessing pavement structural conditions. So the RWD is an innovative laser-based system that you know, officially measures pavement load response under a moving wheel load. Uh, so in this case, the load as you can see in the, the photo here, it's a semi-trailer uh, with a, a single rear axle with dual tires and an 18,000 pound wheel load. So it's equivalently an easel, right? Um, it, can, it captures data traveling at highway speeds. So that makes it highly productive in collecting data. It also eliminates the need for lane closures, which greatly increases safety and tremendously reduces impacts on the traveling public. So the basic system consists of four lasers and a um, spatially coincident methodology for analyzing the data. And those, and together they calculate or measure the deflection of the pavement surface right behind that, that wheel axle. So we shoot a laser down and we get a measurement right behind that axle. We've also added a couple lasers that allow us to, to get the deflection right in front of that axle, about 15 inches in front of it. So. With this system, I mean, we're measuring, as, as many of you will know, we're measuring mills of deflection, and we've got a truck bouncing up and down the road, and we've got macro texture that's probably quantifies an eighth of an inch. So we have a lot of variability in the measurements. So to get, to get meaningful results, we, we do some statistical analysis and averaging of, of hundreds of measurements over a discrete length, which typically if we're traveling about, you know, at an interstate, it'll be about a 500 mile section, then we'll get a representative deflection of, of that pavement section. Here's just some, some closer up views of it. Now, this is an earlier version of, of the RWD. And you can see it consists of the semi-trailer with the, the dual tire single axle uh, load in the, in the rear. We also have the, the reference beam that's hanging off of that. It's an aluminum beam there, it's insulated. And then off that we have, you can see, three Cellcom lasers with the fourth one shown in the right image. It was between the, the tires. Again, this is an earlier version. 
All this equipment, the beam, the lasers, have subsequently been moved up into the, the actual trailer for a variety of reasons, one being safety and durability of the system. We also really need to, to monitor and maintain a constant temperature. Lasers can drift with variations in temperature, so we, we move that up and we keep it in a controlled environment. So the, the lasers and the, the beam undergo regular calibration so we can get a, a reference plane or profile from which we, we take our measurements. And then we have a data acquisition analysis system that's run basically from a laptop that you know, operates from the cab of the truck. So I talked about the spatially coincident methodology and it's depicted sort of here in, in this picture. It's probably one of these charts that if I had a pointer that would work better. But so point one, at the, the top image you can see you've got the wheel load there on the left and the beam you know, proceeding there to the, to the right of that. And you've got four lasers with the D laser located, in this case, right behind the, uh, that axle. So as the, as the vehicle drives down the roadway, points A, B, and C are, are used to establish a reference plane um, or profile of the roadway. And really the A and the B lasers form what we'll call the anchor. Then as the, the truck moves forward, uh, a distance L, which is the distance between the, the lasers. So it's where that laser D is now over where laser C used to be. We, we capture another measurement again. And now this case, B and C are the anchors to this measurement. And we're measuring D, which the difference between those then becomes our, our deflection measurement. So it's a, it's a fairly simple process you know, in which those two sets of measurements are, are then compared and the deflection calculated. And again, I want to point out that you know, we do have a lot of dynamics, a lot of things going along here. So there are, you do have an averaging of, of, a lot of a lot of data to come up with a representative value. I mean, we're collecting data every foot or so and then averaging it over you know, several hundred feet. And I'll, I'll get into that here a little more. So we talk about what the RWD's role in pavement management. It's a network level tool, uh, at least at, at this point. So. You know, where you're collecting information on hundreds, if not thousands of miles of roadway and you're using some digital survey vehicle to, to capture cracking or some, some condition assessment and a profilometer to get IRI. The RWD is another piece of that that gives you the, the structural condition of the roadway. Then after you, you go through your analysis and you start to identify project level sections, maybe you need a rehabilitation design or reconstruction design, you know, then you're going to do a project level study and you're going to use equipment and, techni and techniques that are going to give you more precise information. So an FWD, some coring, even some laboratory work. So I want to make it clear that you know, we're, what we're presenting here is a network level tool and not necessarily a replacement for the FWD. Now, with the FWD stated, there have been over the years a number of studies to compare you know, the results from these two devices. Um, and they're, never, they're not going to line up one-to-one, -one, and a lot of that has to do with the loading mechanisms. The FWD, as most of you know, is an impulse load, and the RWD is a rolling wheel load. And so there's some, there's some difference in how the pavement responds at to begin with, but they're pretty close. And, they're very, and they both are equally effective in delineating sections. So in here, this is some, some FWD data that we had received from the DOT, and then we compared that with our RWD data. And you can see for the PCC sections there and the AC sections in good condition, you know, we have, you know, fairly low deflections and fairly low scatter on the information. As the pavement starts to deteriorate, you're getting fair, maybe even poorer conditions, you're going to see both systems show a much greater scatter on the data and, and higher deflections. So, there is, there is some comparison between them. So that's kind of the background on the, on the, the laser-based uh, RWD. I want to get into our, our case study. And again, this was a Federal Highway uh, Administration sponsored study that we did in collaboration with the Oklahoma DOT. And really the purpose of it was to you know, evaluate what were the potential benefits of incorporating the RWD into the pavement management process. You know, what, is there a benefit in terms of cost savings, network performance, um, and so on? So we work with them and, and basically work with the pavement management group to, 
to identify a, sex, you know, a, a subset of their, their network, go through their pavement management process with it using their, their current process, which has very limited, if any, uh, structural information in terms of deflection data or other structural measures, and then compare that with uh, an, a scenario or an analysis using the RWD, and then looking at how did that impact treatment selection, cost, and network performance. So the, the test section was uh, Division 5 in, in Oklahoma. It's about a 1,000 mile uh, centerline a mile network that they identified for us. I think it's in the southwest part of the state. This particular case, it was primarily flexible pavements. Um, I think I think 96% of, of the roadways were, were asphalt. About 4% were composite pavement. And just a real small part were... Uh, or concrete and then they had a breakdown let's see here it was uh we had high medium and low traffic volumes about half of it was what we'll call low volume roads uh, about 40 percent was what they call you know like their arterials and then there was 14 percent was their their primary highways in some interstates so to do the testing for the thousand miles just to kind of give you a, a sense of the pr production it was four and a half days to do this and the interstates, we collected uh, data in both directions. We drive the outer, outer traffic lane in both directions. On the other roads, we just drove in one direction. So, so you're looking, and here was, you know, we're look, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 200, 250 miles per day is what we were, we were able to capture. And that, you know, that accounts for you know, deadheads and things like that. So it, you can have uh, quite a bit of pr production with the, the system. So additionally, um, we had to collect data uh, from, from ODOT, and they were kind enough to share that with us. So in Oklahoma, the majority of their, their uh, performance monitoring is conducted or derived using indices, and they have a pavement quality index. It's a function of ride quality, riding measurements, and distress. And this is information that they collect they collect it annually. I don't know if they do it network-wide annually. Um, so let's use to come up with a, a pavement quality index. And they also collect some structural data. They do some FWD testing, uh, not annually, but occasionally on the, on the interstate. And then they, they have a structural rating. It's a subjective rating that they apply to the other roads. And that was, it's really just a trigger to identify sections that uh, need reconstructed. It's not really used in any modeling or any performance prediction. And then they have the usual, you know, the rest of the day, the pavement age, layer type thickness, and, and traffic. So it, we looked at that data and then, you know, embarked on an analysis there. So they used the, the DTEMPS. ODOT uses the, the DTEMPS software that was implemented um, by Dayton Associates. They've had that in place for some, for some time. Uh, ODOT has static pavement sections and their network. They're not using dynamic segmentation. And then they have performance models and engineering models for each pavement type in terms of their uh, selections. And then they use really a decision tree process. So that's a function, as you should. So on this slide, look like at their PQI, their, their pavement quality index, the traffic level, uh, structural condition, which a lot of times is a subjective rating. And then they really just look at categories of treatments. So they have a preservation, a rehabilitation, and a replacement treat, uh, or their basic treatments. So, so what we looked at is they evaluated several treatment strategies for this thousand mile network. So the base strategy was you know, basically to try to mimic what ODOT does, and which is primarily just to use their PQI, so to use uh, right quality, cracking, and rutting as the major factors in selecting a, a strategy. And then we looked at um, two modified approaches where we could incorporate RWD data. And I'll show you how, how we did that. And then the basis was, well, how does that compare in terms of cost and then in performance of the network over a period of time? So here's their, I'll call the, the base case, the PQI that really you know, mimics pretty closely what ODOT's doing. So they have um, PQI, which is on a scale of zero to 100, which is like the PCI. Um, and then they have different treatment matrices for low, medium, and high traffic. And 
Low, I believe, is less than 2,000 vehicles. Highs, greater than 10,000 vehicles per day, and mediums in between that. So for each of those, then they have you know, a preservation, which they currently use only on low traffic uh, roads, a low volume system. Rehabilitation, which would be you know, an overlay, and then complete replacement. And you can see the, the trigger values at which they do that. And this is a little bit of a simplification of what they do for, for illustrative purposes, but it does generally mimic what they do. Um, one thing I want to note in here as we, as we evaluated the, the data of the 1,000 miles um, that, that, that ODOT selected for us to evaluate, this network, or the subset of the network was in pretty good condition. It had a PQI of about 92 was the average, so uh, they'd done a pretty good job of maintaining that, that part of their, their system. So uh, that will play out, and I'll show that a little later. It plays out in the results to a certain extent. Um, so in our second strategy, which I'll call um, RWD1, we, we looked at using the RWD data to expand upon the, the use of preservation. So we have an RWD measurement, low, medium, and high for each of these, uh, for these. And the low, medium, high is really based on, enough, many of you remember Asphalt Institute MS-17 goes all the way back to the Binkelman Beam uh, procedure. And this is what ODOT had in place where they look at traffic levels and determine the maximum deflection that you could have without requiring an overlay. So those were sort of the trigger values for each of those. So when we say a low, medium, or high deflection, that's different whether it's low volume or high volume roadways. So in this first, you can see by incorporating the RWD data, we could extend where the areas where preservation would be an applicable treatment selection. Uh, if you had low deflections for, for the medium and high, uh, traffic scenarios. And we think this is, you know, this is a, a very realistic, very appropriate use of, of that type of data. Um, then what I'll call RWD2, we expanded on these, and, and maybe was, we're a little aggressive here, definitely based on our experience or, or things that agency have do, but we tried to, to get a little far to the right in terms of, of using preservation. So you can see um, we extended it to sections that had what we'll call a medium deflection rating, still a, a good structural condition, nothing where, nothing where you had a structural deficiency. And then we also lowered some of the thresholds at which um, preservation can be applied, as well as the rehab, trying to identify those situations where the RWD could clearly identify good structural conditions that would allow us to uh, with some confidence, you know, apply a preservation treatment or, you know, in this case, a, an overlay. So that was really the three scenarios we looked at. Um, and then we, we, we ran their analysis. We looked at a, over a 20-year period of, of, what we've, of what would be the performance. And, it, you know, for the sake of this presentation, what we looked at is what would it take to maintain the target PQI of 92? We already had a very high rating. So... What would it take to, to maintain that uh, with the PQI being the base case, so there was no change in cost there? Um, but if you looked at the RWD, the second option, we were able just to expand the, the use of preservation just slightly and to do that in, in a smart way. We identified sections. Uh, like Mr. Hall had indicated earlier, sections that had good structural conditions and would be good candidates for, for preservation type treatment, a, a microsurfacing or a very thin overlay, you know, we could reduce that cost, you know, in the neighborhood of 10% for this particular network. Now, I will say we've done, we've done a similar analysis like this for, for multiple agencies, state agencies, as, as well as like county governments. I would say the range that we typically find is 5 to 10%. So this, these findings or these results here were probably at the upper of that range that we had find. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the, the network was in pretty good condition at the time we evaluated. Had, had there been a, a greater dis, uh, distribution of conditions and you'd have had you know, maybe a lower overall PQI, I think that number would have came down some. So 
So it was about 10%, and even when we expanded then, you know, we, we were fairly aggressive in the use of, of preservation. You could see we only really got a small increase in the savings there. I mean, we kind of, just by handling and addressing those roads that had really good structural conditions is really where we could drive the benefit. So it clearly showed that, you know, there's, there's a benefit to keeping good roads in good condition in, in terms of cost savings. So really the conclusions um, from this, you could see that you know, by incorporating network level deflection data, in this case it was from the RWD, I think you get a, you can drive a benefit from a, a, the use of, of paper preservation and you can do it you know, in an educated way. So pavements in good or at least fair structural condition, you can, you can target as candidates for preservation and have some confidence in applying it. Similarly, Roads that are in poor structural condition, you can trigger those and avoid projects where you get really early failures, you know, of say a thin overlay or a microsurfacing. So that, you know, there's two benefits here. One is to broaden the use, but also not to, to use preservation in places it shouldn't be. Um, and as I mentioned, the cost savings can be quite considerable. We typically find five to 10%. This particular case happened to be a little higher. So, um, and it really depends on you know, the network you're looking at and their strategy for, for re repairing the roads. So they, they really summarize um, what I had to talk about, you know, the case study. Um, and I want to go in just briefly, and I think it, it dovetails in with some of the earlier talks about gaps in technologies and some things that could possibly fill that. So we've made some recent advancements in, in the RWD technology, and what we've We've had in the past was a laser-based system, as I depicted, you know, earlier. Um, and it, you know, it's a very robust, the, the laser system was very robust and, and had a lot of benefits to it. But, you know, some of the drawbacks were that we had to do a lot of averaging of dating points to get a representative number. Uh, we couldn't get measurements at a discrete location. And getting the whole basin, you know, would have taken quite a bit of laser. So that, you know, there were some, there's definitely some drawbacks to that. So. What we've, just this past year, have, have come up with a, a technology. So this is on the same system. We actually used the, the left side of the trailer for this uh, to show it here and what we've been using recently. So we have a system of cameras and LED lights that we're using to, to evaluate the, uh, the pavement. So we're capturing imaging, images and using stereo pair technology to, uh, to determine not only the maximum deflection, but really uh, the, the whole deflection basin. So what I, sh I show here, you can see the LED lights and the, and the two cameras and uh, I think right in front of the wheel there is just another set of LED lights that we've got hooded so we can really get uh, some, some good lighting down uh, around it between the tires. There's just another shot if you can see the bottom of those, those LED lights. And it's, it's really part of the magic of what we're doing is with the LEDs. We're using overpowered LEDs uh, to essentially, you know, eliminate shadows. I mean, we're drowning out sunlight with that to, to allow us to capture some, some high resolution imagery. So I'll just go through briefly the basic methodology of what we're, of what we're doing here. So if, imagine you're driving the RWD down, down the, uh, the roadway here. So the first camera in unison with a the, the lights flashing will capture an image of, of what we'll call the undeflected region. So we're away from the wheel loads and we're in an area where the, the pavement is, is not deflected. Then as we drive, continue to drive forward, we take a second image of this, this same area, but now it's undergoing, you know, loading from that, that rear axle. And we're capturing enough length of that image that we're, we're getting but the, capturing the entire deflection basin, but we're also getting outside of, of the basin, so we have an undeflected area. So we have two images now that we then post-process using stereo pair technology. So if you can think of that, what we'll do is, we'll, we'll call it register the images, those in, in photogrammetry. So think of X, Y, and Z coordinates. So the first thing we're gonna do with those two sets of images is get the X and Y coordinates exactly on top of each other. We're going to lay pixel on pixel. So you've got aggregate particle, rock, whatever, 
whatever features we can identify in the surface, we're going to lay one on top of the other using, using our uh, software and algorithms to do that. So we have one image laying right on top of the other. Then we're going to take the Z coordinate and we'll look at what I'll show is this undeflected area. We're going to match that right with the same pixels on the previous photo that's undeflected. And the, we're going to establish those the differences in the Z coordinate for those sets of pixels to, pixels to be zero, as they are. They're both undeflected. Then we're going to calculate the differences in, in the Z coordinate between the two images for the rest of the, of the region, the deflected region. So what we come up with, so this first picture is going to be, you know, what the cameras are going to see. And again, here's where a pointer would be really good. But it would, uh, the top there, those, those brown items, that's, that's the actual the, the tires. That's the front of the tires. And then you can see what we'll have called deflection contours around it. Um, it's tough to see that scale on the right, but you're looking about 70 mils. This was a very, very weak pavement section where we, we captured this. So. We're 70 mils all the way out to where you get to the blue, which is, you know, happens in a couple of feet. In this particular case, you know, we go from 70 mils to essentially zero mil deflection. Now, because of the way the cameras are, are shooting onto the, the pavement surface, we we're really capturing a trapezoid uh, area of the pavement surface. So we have to transpose that to get the image in the middle so you can get a little a better sense of, uh, of how that deflection uh, profile is. You can actually see, so to the left of that image is where the second set of tires are. You can see sort of some of the deflection actually bleed over to that second set of, of dual tires. So there would be, you know, the basic output would be a, a deflection contour. Now from that, and I think you can see here, if I was to draw a longitudinal line from the middle of those, those two wheels and extend that out to the deflection area, um, I can extract uh, a profile uh, of the entire basin, which is shown there in the, uh, the far right image there. So this is what we're looking then extracting out of that. So we now I've captured the, the entire deflection basin. So, this, so now no longer are we having to average a bunch of points to get just the max deflection, but now at a discrete point, we can, we can get the entire deflection basin which quickly, just with this information alone, if you want to get some structural index, like an area method or some curvature index, something that didn't require a known layer of thickness, you now have sufficient data to do that right away. We've done some testing with some in-pavement sensors. Here's where we made multiple runs of the, the RWD on a pavement with some, it's a local road with a lot of varying conditions, and you can see the deflections are, are pretty high and they have a lot of scatter. But we put some accelerometers in the pavement, and you can see at three different locations. And despite all of the, the noise and chatter, we tied in pretty closely to those accelerometers. And we were typically, we were testing, we were catching images every six feet. So we were with, within six feet of, of those accelerometers when those measurements were captured. So, you know, the, the early validation of the system has shown that we are getting some, some accurate measurements. So, with that, I'm, I'm done. And hopefully I've been able to show you what we've done, where we've been. You know, most importantly, I think, is to show that, you know, that this, there are systems out there that can collect the data to support you know, pavement preservation. And they're out there and they're available. And they're being advanced. And I think what Kelvin shows you in terms of 3D imagery and what I was able to show here and, and what we're doing, I think there's, there's still a lot of work to be done, but we're, we're gaining gain on this pretty quickly. Thank you.